welcome to the No Street Lights podcast. I'm Aaron. And I'm Tim. We'll be engaging in vulnerable conversations every Friday to shine a light on what we've been through, how it changed us, and what we learned. We want to encourage societal growth towards kindness through understanding. These conversations and the associated language can be triggering. Listen at your own discretion. But please reach out if we need to be doing something better. So, let's take a breath, relax, and be welcome. Happy Friday, Aaron. Happy... That's not... Uh, today's not Friday, Timothy. What are you talking about? The day of release is Friday, Aaron. Oh, so it's Friday now? It's Friday for the listeners, yes. Oh. Well, in that case, everyone, please welcome a great friend of the channel, another person trying to encourage societal growth towards kindness through understanding, Jarl Skogi. Good day, everybody. Skogi, welcome to the show, brother. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. Really, really uh, uh, proud to be part of this. It's awesome. And I really appreciate you guys for inviting me on. Yeah, I really appreciate you for doing all that great work you're doing on your TikTok and the messages that you're providing out there for the world. I mean, you're putting so much positive energy out there. <laughs> it only makes sense that our paths crossed eventually. I definitely, definitely appreciate that. I, I, it's been a long path for me to get to where I am, and I'm, I'm more than happy to share everything I can about uh, what got me to where I am. So personally, I'm sorry it took us this long to make this collab happen. But now that it's here, do you mind telling the people a little bit about your story or what you're pursuing? Absolutely. Um, in order to discuss uh, where I've arrived, it's difficult to not discuss where I've been, of course. Uh, I would call my upbringing troubled, not horrible, not the worst, not anything of that nature. However, um, a difficulty in kind of gelling with the society of youth was always evident. Uh, scholastically, I struggled. Um, socially, I struggled. My divergent thinking put a target on my back. So unfortunately, that led down some paths that weren't so healthy. Uh, it also led me to places where mentally uh, I was not exactly the most positive person. Uh, it took a very long time and a lot of different um, instances and issues before I was able to finally start confronting the parts of myself that I knew were not where I wanted to be. So at the age of about 38, I had my first counseling session when I determined that uh, my use of alcohol had gotten a little bit too far into the realm of potential alcoholism. I was able to stop myself before anything terrible happened, and I'm thankful for that. However, um, there was some damage done. And to undo that damage, uh, various schools of thought were explored. Um, I, of course, like I said, I, I started doing counseling, um, started discussing with professionals about exactly how I needed to tackle certain aspects of my personality. And I had resolved in myself to begin pursuing a more positive frame of mind. And when you've been born, bred, and beaten <laughs> into pessimism, it's very difficult to pry yourself, pry your mind away from that type of thinking. My determination was, it's hard for me to be positive about myself, so I'm going to be positive to others instead. That came fairly easily. So the TikTok channel kind of evolved. It started out with me just doing stuff for fun and kind of making jokes, which I still occasionally do a skit or make a joke or whatever the case is. But by and large now, it serves for me to use that platform to spread that positive message to others. And in doing so, and I've even shared this in a couple of TikToks, it's actually improved my opinion of myself. I'm able to look at myself with much kinder eyes because I've pervade that emotion. I've pervade that positivity to others. So in a nutshell, I suppose that's uh, that's how I got to where I am. That's absolutely beautiful. And I'm sure a lot of the listeners right now are hearing us refer to you as Jarl, uh, which your TikTok is at Jarl Skogi. Am I correct? Correct. 
Perfect. And we'll make sure there's a link down below. But uh, I do think the the name Jarl fits you perfectly because you are a king in your own domain here. Um, before we continue on with the episode, I do want to give our listeners a little bit of a heads up. If you are listening to us on an audio podcast uh, format, media consumption location, such as Spotify, Apple, iHeartMedia, or iHeartRadio, uh, mm -hmm. Pandora, um, I don't know, I think we can play on Samsung refrigerators as well. Um, and probably something with Amazon. If you're listening to us there, we really appreciate it if you would subscribe and, uh, you know, keep updated with whenever we drop a new episode, which, surprise, surprise, is every Friday. And if you are interested, we are also in video format. Uh, you can find us on YouTube, No Streetlights Podcast. You can look us up very simply. The links are down below. If you do feel so inclined, subscribe to the channel and you can find video format of our episodes there. Uh, I think that is the only plugs I really have at this time. So I think I want to find out a little bit more about you, Jarl. Absolutely. Um, one of the things that I thought was most surprising um, in my pursuit of being a better person and, and going through the, the psychological uh, evaluations and the types of, of um analytical um, sit downs I've had with my counselors. Uh, the determination to be more positive and start doing those things on TikTok and, and just trying to be less negative actually lent itself to a school of thinking that I wasn't familiar with at the time. But as I started pursuing a higher education recently, you know, because you're 40 years old, why not go back to college? Uh, I found in my psychological studies a term that really kind of made my ears perk up. And as I read through it, it actually made me slightly emotional because I realized, man, I've actually kind of accidentally stumbled upon a method of thinking that is highly promoted in the, in the schools of psychology. And that is what we call unconditional positive regard. And if I may, I'll read um, kind of verbatim how that sounds or looks. Unconditional positive regard is a set of Behaviors, including being genuine, open to experience, transparent, able to listen to others, self-disclosing, and empathetic. When we treat ourselves or others with unconditional positive regard, we express understanding and support. Even while we may acknowledge failings, unconditional positive regard allows us to admit our fears and failures, to drop our pretenses, and yet at the same time, to feel completely accepted for who we are. And like I said, that 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 I wasn't expecting to read that. And when I did, I I was blown away. I said, wow, I've been doing this. I've been doing this correctly. Even I've been looking at people through this lens and it has indeed proven to be so effective for me and my walk and the, the type of person that I want to be. And it was, it was the gravity of that, that situation, just knowing that I got something right without having that prior knowledge of, of such a thing was, it's very monumental. It was wonderful. So and this is just me approaching this from uh, I have no idea what unconditional positive regard is. This is definitely my first time ever hearing about it. So can you kind of, kind of give me a little bit of history about it and maybe kind of break it down in, in simplistic terms what we're talking about? I'll do my very best to make it as simplistic as I possibly can. Um, Carl Rogers was kind of the pioneer of this uh, whole thing. He was the one who, who believed that uh, we could achieve full potential from uh, emotional fulfillment or for emotional fulfillment in that concept. Uh, he developed it as a psychological tool. So whereas uh, in modern psychology, a lot of Carl Rogers theories and expectations have been overshadowed by other people's work as happens often in the school of psychology, uh, he, this, this basic empathy and understanding and just an attempt to kind of look at everything with a light of positivity is still highly promoted even in modern psychology. So really that's, that's what it is, is that having that empathy for yourself, for others, giving grace where grace is due things like giving people the benefit of the doubt wherever possible, which plays into uh, my personal mission statement, which I'll be happy to read for you gentlemen here, if you'll allow me. Please. Yes. 
So uh, this I developed uh, through reading a book that was geared toward leadership, but uh, I found that a lot of those books based on leadership help out in a lot of life circumstances, parenting, you know, friendships, even, you know, minor things like where you need to lead a group through, a, a, you know, one of those goofy escape rooms or whatever the case is. Uh, but the recommendation was that I, I come up with a personal mission statement. So to it, I will be intentionally kind. I will appreciate those who work for me and recognize their sacrifices, achievements, and hardships. I will give those who do wrong the benefit of the doubt wherever reasonable. I will not allow kindness to be construed as weakness. I will rise to challenge negative stereotypes wherever I'm able. I will work for and with those I lead to ensure they're taken care of. I will promote mental health and do all I am capable to remove the stigma surrounding the same. I will lead whole people, not just employees. I will strive to remain in control of my emotions. I will give myself grace when I fall short. I am worthy. And there's that's a little. Oh. Go ahead, please. No, no, please, please. You. Yeah. <laughs> no, I was just going to say that's a phenomenal mission statement. And I think a lot of us could benefit from developing one ourselves, you know, having that on our uh, bathroom mirror in the morning and reminding ourselves of that purpose. Yeah. And that was kind of, that's kind of the drive behind uh, making a mission statement for, for anyone really is to help you kind of maintain a visual on what your goals and aspirations are as a person, as a, you know, leader, as a individual, whatever the case may be. So um, I, I pull that up every once in a while and just look at it and make sure I'm still checking myself and that I'm not, you know, straying a little bit further into the, the person I used to be or the person that I'm trying to be better than. And honestly, it, 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 there's a lot of little tools that sound kind of goofy when you look at the face value of them, but they're really handy. And there's there's a few other things that that I've learned that I'd be happy to share with everybody here as we as we continue our, our conversation. But uh, I think that is a wonderful place to start out. Yeah, I feel that your your mission statement feels like a combination of a purpose, like laying out a purpose for yourself, but also providing motivation to see that through, which I really like that. It it feels like a complete, I mean, Aaron, you said it perfectly, you know, people should have that on their bathroom mirror instead of like eat, pray, love, or whatever the hell, live, laugh, love, or whatever the hell is out there, right? I feel like your mission statement makes a little bit more sense as, as a sticker that I'd put somewhere. Um, might be a little long for like a bumper sticker, but I, I would definitely put it somewhere where I could read it frequently. It, it's and it's crazy, too, because the more that we work our way through as any kind of like leadership management positions where we have to deal with, you know, inspiring and asking things of our employees, our people, the more you start realizing how unique it is to be a manager who cares about their employees as a person. And it, it blows my mind because I feel like if you are in any kind of leadership position, developing a personal relationship and some kind of um, rapport with your employees is like step number one. Like if you opened up the manager handbook that is probably buried somewhere on the internet with a bunch of memes covering it, if you open it up, it should be the first line. Build rapport with your employees. Treat them like humans. But people have 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 gone so far away from that that mentality, and I feel like it's it's just not. It we're taking multiple steps backwards. You know, like we're heading back to the eighteen hundreds at this point. Come on, guys, this is twenty twenty four. How do we not know intuitively to treat people like humans? Yeah, it's a it's a very alarming thing in uh, in society throughout you know any echelon of society, no matter where we talk about whether that's business or even um, you know uh, the the local market or whatever the case may be, ma and pa shops. It's 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 universal, which is extremely sad. And one of the things that I think uh, is 
really important to do is build that rapport. Mm -hmm. Essentially, um, you know, think about the the kinds of places where that rapport exists. Think about the types of things that you do as a, as a leader that are far more, um, you know, have far more gravity than simply, you know, a, a person that you see for eight hours every once in a while or every other day or whatever the case may be. Uh, I think the, the finest example of where our leadership should be the strongest is with uh, our, our children. Uh, for those that that have children, uh, I believe that the leadership books and things like that that uh, I found most useful are 100% applicable because it talks about um, empathy, leading the whole person. You know, this is uh, this is a, a person's life in some way, shape, or form, and we not we may not be influencing their life 100% of the time, but for those those moments where we have their attention and we are to lead them, we should be building that rapport, be building that relationship. And remember, these are whole people. These are not just some abstract. It's not just your employee. It's a person. And those types of empathy are the the types of things that I've strived to establish. One thing that the media, quote unquote, I hate saying that because it's so nebulous, Mm. but one of the things that's really driven purchasing and uh, viewership is that antagonistic way of viewing of it's you versus me. Everyone on the outside is some asshole. And even uh, I can't wait till the film civil war comes to streaming platforms. Cause I have no idea what it's about, but it seems to be rather uh, captivating. But in that same vein, I watch tons of parenting stuff and I'm fixed. I'm not having kids anytime soon because we have to parent ourselves through things. We have to heal ourselves in that same regard. And one thing that Mr. Chaz says all the time is parents far too often see their kids as giving them a hard time as opposed to having a hard time. This world is so fucked up that, you know, how could we possibly come to grips with things without a fully developed prefrontal cortex? The three of us have a hopefully by this point, fully developed prefrontal cortexes. And I struggle all the fucking time. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, that's a, that's an important note to remember when we talk about, you know, the whole person. Uh, a lot of times people lose sight of the fact that their their children are often experiencing things for the very first time. And, you know, whereas you may know that falling down and scraping your knee is probably, you know, about a three on the pain scale to them, it's a 10. They've never experienced anything else. That's the worst pain that they've ever experienced. So, you know, rub some dirt on it, pick it up. You know, you're fine. You know, no, they're not. That's the worst thing they've ever experienced. (laughs) The first scrape knee, the first uh, uh, bump on the head, whatever the case may be. The first paper Um, cut, that one. Yeah. (laughs) Those are nasty. (laughs) They're still bad. Yeah. It stings (laughs) like hell. Um, But that's, that's one of those things. And, you know, we, when I talk about the the types of things that I've read, it is not only these leadership books, there's also an amazing book with an amazing title. Uh, it's called How to Stop Losing Your Shit with Your Kids. And in that, a lot of these topics are covered when we talk about parenting. You know, um, when we when we have to look at the world through somebody else's eyes, we have to remember that 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 first person bias, my perspective is not the only perspective. I don't get to be the one to say, you should feel like this. You should feel like that. I have to be the one that says, I don't understand a hundred percent what you're going through, but I do understand that you're having a hard time and I'm here to help where I can. And that is kind of that, that same unconditional positive regard, that same idea of, of being there, being present and helping people through whatever their troubles may be. Even if for a moment your brain says, hey, that's not a big deal. We don't, you know, that, that's, that's small potatoes compared to now. That's where we need to stop and think about this person and their individual perspectives and experiences. Uh, it's, it's a difficult place to put yourself a lot of the times and it takes a lot of practice. And uh, I certainly haven't gotten it perfect yet, but we're trying. <laughs> And while we're on the topic of children, so in your experiences with practicing unconditional positive regard, how have you felt that's affect, affected your interactions with 
children, adolescents, or even if uh, if you have anybody with mental health issues, do you think it's it's changed the conversation or how the conversation could go? I absolutely do. Um, the The strangest part of me raising my children, uh, my daughter is very much, um, you know, she's not a whole lot like me as far as a lot of things are concerned. She has my eyes and the hair color I used to have <laughs> and a few other minor features, but by and large, she's uh, scholastically brilliant and, um, you know, just has a, a very different perspective on the world. And my son, on the other hand, uh, the, the, the joke I constantly make is Scoggins men don't breed. We clone uh, if you just take me and just make a new version of me that looks the same, thinks the same, acts the same, that's pretty much how we do things. My father, his father, my son, me, if you looked at pictures of all of us, you wouldn't be able to tell who's who. Uh, even our mentalities are very similar. Uh, my son um, was diagnosed with ADHD and the same struggles he has in school are the struggles I had in school, which was then very easy to get me diagnosed for ADHD. So in, in those conversations and in all this um, differences and similarities, that still begs the question, what is his perspective? And the easiest answer to how should I deal with X, Y, or Z is asking questions is better than making assumptions. I should ask him how he feels about the experience he has. I should ask him what's going on. I should ask him how he's thinking about what just happened to him. Instead of assuming that because I went through that just like he did, I should stop and ask. Just because we are so similar does not mean he has the same perspectives. So in all this that I've learned, in all the, the, the studies I've seen, that's been the best answer asking questions. It sounds so simple, but it is very difficult, especially if, when, you know, if, you know, you come from a sterner parenting background, like that's difficult. It's difficult to not uh, accidentally visit upon your children, the, the negative things that were visited upon you, breaking those, those generational uh, uh, cycles of, you know, things like spanking and, and, and such that have been proven clinically to not really have any benefit. So I think that, a lot of what we do as parents and as uh, even teachers of, of children when the opportunities arise is that we, we neglect to remember that even though those, those little people aren't quite fully developed, we still need to ask them questions and help them work through those emotions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, the more that we're sitting here talking about unconditional positive regard, it, it really makes me wonder. So we've all heard the term Freudian slip. Right. Everybody's heard that term. All of our listeners have guaranteed they've heard it at least once. And if not, it's it's you should look it up. Um, but yeah, uh, Freud. I don't know why his first name is, is drawing a blank. Sigmund. Sigmund. Yeah. Yeah. The, Sigmund Freud. So pretty much everything, all of almost from if I understand correctly, I am not uh, in college. I do not study psychology. I just pick up little tidbits of information from place to place. From my understanding, most of Sigmund Freud's um, diagnosis and theories have essentially been disproven and debunked these days. And yet we still keep terminology like Freudian slip around, like it's in it's in our our vernacular. Um, but we have a guy over here, Carl Rogers, who pioneers this unconditional positive regard. And I feel like it's a dramatically more important and probably way more useful um, tool in therapy and outside of therapy. And why don't we have like a, a, a Rogerian slip, you know, <laughs> like it's, it's a dumb question, but like if somebody is just being, you know, kind and empathetic towards somebody, be like, Oh man, that guy had a, a Rogerian slip. <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah uh, it can be like a positive term. Yeah, no. And, and that's one of those things that I think uh, it, it's what's hot and what's, uh, what's 
appealing to the public. Sigmund Freud, what a name, right? That's yeah. that's such an interesting name, and I think that might be part of the appeal is that it's it's just the name of the of the man himself was was mm-hmm. so interesting. Uh, Carl Rogers, on the other hand, is is it's not that spicy. It doesn't really, you know, it's it's, it's he's got two fairly, first names. Yeah, it's a fairly basic name. It's it's fairly mundane, so it's mm-hmm. it's it's not. It doesn't quite have that that sex appeal, if you will, uh, as Sigmund Freud does. And uh, Sigmund Freud did, in fact, get a lot of his work um, kind of overshadowed, um, corrected, however you want to look at it. But some of his uh, his ideas and policies do still exist within therapy. Mm-hmm. Um, he hasn't been totally 100 percent debunked. Some of his ideas and theories have. But uh, a lot of it was still there was there was meat there. Mm-hmm. There was some good stuff mixed in with all the all the other other things. So we we do still hold on to some of his ideas, uh, but by and large, I th- I think that's kind of the the idea behind what we're talking about is that it, it's just he's got a, a really cool name, and it's easy to say that you know Sigmund Freud, the the father of psychology or whatever the case is, even if that's not a hundred percent the case. That's what a lot of people basically feel like is that he is the father of, of modern psychology. And he did pioneer a lot of the techniques that are still happening in a lot of practices. So yeah. that's just kind of one of those things where there are people that have done more important work. There are people that have, that have made huge leaps. You know, when we talk about like the, the, the big five, the, the model of uh, our behaviors and things like that, um, those were all pioneered by others and there have been different schools of thought in, in psychology and everything like that. But all of that stuff, you know, it's, it's, it's not nearly as popular and, and out there as the work of Sigmund Freud, which is funny. Which makes sense. And little side note here. Uh, the only reason why I mentioned it is because during my relatively brief uh, refresher on unconditional positive regard, uh, I did read that it did start, it changed the way therapists interacted with their patients and uh it looked it sorry the exact verbiage is something along the lines of so the therapist client relationship um was part of a cure versus like the Freudian uh view as therapist patient relationship being a means to an end uh which I thought was really cool and I I like the fact that we're talking about something that was one of the things that phased out the the father of modern psychology. It phased out something that he had looked at and said, this is how I think it should be. And then Carl Rogers steps up. I, I don't know how many, how much longer after Freudian or after Freud, but he stepped up and he was like, actually, but you mentioned the big five. Uh, what is that? So the, the big five, uh, also known as the five factors or the five factor model of personality, uh, the principles of which uh, have to do with how we behave as individuals. And it, it's it's a categoric kind of thing to kind of put people into uh, a different, um, I don't want to say boxes, that sounds so, you know, uh, um, final, but uh, it basically gives us ideas as to uh, a person's behavior and where they might come from. So um, the first one is openness to experience. The second is conscientiousness. Then there's extroversion um, agreeableness and neuroticism. And each of those kind of have their own connotations to what they actually are. And I I said first and second, all that stuff, but there really is no worry. You can remember the acronym ocean, or there's a a few other, um, uh, acronyms that you can, you can put to it to help you remember, but basically like it's, it's looking at the, those, those terms on both ends of the spectrum. So, you know, openness to experience or closed off to experiences. That'll be your, your kind of baseline conscientiousness, being a more conscious person or being a not so conscious person, uh, extroversion or introversion, uh, agreeableness or disagreeableness. If you're a, a naysayer all the time for fun, you know, uh, neuroticism is of course, like when you get into the more like divergent, um, thinking the, the disorders and depression, anxiety, those types of things. So um, those big five are used by um, psychologists quite a bit to help kind of understand um, differences in people's behaviors. Hmm. Yeah, I don't think I've I don't think I've ever heard that before, but I'm going to definitely remember ocean now. I might not remember 100 percent what it stands for, but I'm definitely going to remember it. Um, And how so what what is the purpose of it, though? Like, why? 
why do we have this this category the the big five personality traits like what 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 does that does that just help us like determine what kind of person somebody is or is it like what what exactly are we doing with it yeah it's just a personality models so it, it gives uh, psychologists baselines for how people are going to interact with them and with others and it gives them a rough idea because that's all that's all we really have is rough ideas it's not supposed to be a concrete thing where like oh you're you're your extroversion is really high. So you, you must be a super outgoing person all the time. Like it's, it's a baseline factor that just helps kind of predict some things that may or may not happen. Uh, it, it's, it's not a, a solid thing. You're not going to be um, extroverted in every situation. There'll be some situations where that extroversion gets dialed back a bit because just like anybody will tell you, the me that I give to somebody I don't like is not the same me that I give to a friend or a family member. It's circumstantial in a lot of regards. And psychologists recognize this, but that five factor model is just kind of a baseline for general behavior. So that's that makes kind sense. of where it lies. Yeah. So if we're talking about unconditional positive regards, so if me, if I, if I wanted to start implementing that more in my life and around to those around me if i took a look at my my big five personality traits like what in your opinion here like what what do you think i should try and focus my energies towards like are we talking because to me it seems like being friendly and compassionate would kind of fit more so focus on my agreeableness right so mm -hmm. think about that and enhance my agreeableness in order to um grow my unconditional positive regard towards others and myself. Yeah. So um, the way that everything fits into an individual is going to be difficult because quite frankly, there is no one size fits all for just about anything in life. Uh, for me, it was much easier for me to begin with encouraging others. For some, it may be far easier for them to begin encouraging themselves. Uh, I am actually fairly introverted and the me that I present on TikTok and the me that I present if I was approached by a stranger who just wanted to say hello, whatever the case is, is my masking in that I basically put on the facade that I am extroverted. I'm able to do that kind of thing. I'm able to, to not so much perform, but rather just kind of pull myself out of that men mental space where I am, I am introverted and I don't want to interact. If someone approaches me, I can, I can flip that switch and become a more agreeable person, but that's me. That's not necessarily anybody else. There might be introverts that are deathly afraid of other interactions, and it may be easier for them to internalize those positive uh, interactions rather than externalize them. And that may be where they need to start. Um, if a person is extroverted, but they're, they're still like, oh, this, giving people compliments sounds awful funny. I don't want to look in the mirror and tell myself how awesome I am. That sounds weird too. You can start super small. It doesn't have to be anything big. It can just be like, I did a good job. You did a good job. Good job, everybody. And those, those little things that you start doing and then just exponentially allowing them to grow. That's kind of what you have to suss out for yourself. And I, I can't state enough that anybody who's listening, anybody who uh, is, is wondering if, if they should go get help for whatever their, their concerns are, there's nothing wrong with professional help. Uh, it took me a long time to seek that help for myself because I had external uh, stressors that made me a little more fearful of getting it. But at the end of the day, there, there's really nothing that's stopping a person from taking care of themselves. Mental health care, is healthcare. If you were sick and you needed to go see a doctor, you wouldn't hesitate. So if your brain isn't feeling good, why should you hesitate to take care of it? And there are people out there that are, that are willing to help you work through this stuff. Even if it's just, you know, I, I just want to be more positive. There's somebody who can help you right now, figure out how to be more positive. And like I said, not, not a one size fits all. I can't tell you how the best method for you to be um, a more positive person would be. I can't tell you how to begin your journey, <clears throat> pardon me, to begin using that uh, positive regard for others because I am not a psychologist yet. <laughs> we're working towards it. Yeah, we're getting I there. Do, 
And I do want to hear more about your own personal story instead of these abstract theories. Once you kind of found this unconditional positive regard and you started being more, as I would say, loving towards those outside of you, how did that change your life on a day-to-day basis? Oh, yeah. Um, I would say uh, through uh, my my different counselors, through my um, continued education, and even outside of college, I've, I've been interested in philosophy and psychology. It's uh, been a pursuit, and I, I shudder to, to bring up philosophy because it always sounds so pretentious. <laughs> but the, the, the truth is that's where, that's where the foundation of psychology lies, is with a lot of the, the ancient Greek uh, philosophers and Stoics and things like that, which, um, again, I, I have to recommend that... Uh, if you're if you're in a place where you would enjoy reading such things, that you you check out Epictetus, uh, you check out uh, Hippocrates, Socrates, uh, Seneca, Marcus Aurelius, all those uh, all those characters from the ancient Greek realm that uh, kind of fathered a lot of these concepts. Um, but for me, what I ended up doing was uh, the first few times I went to a counselor, uh, they talk to me about, you know, just being more positive, which I thought was just silly. You know, that's just silly. I, I, I don't, I don't need to look at myself in the mirror. And like I just said a few minutes ago, I don't want to look at myself in the mirror and tell myself I'm, I'm handsome or I'm good at, you know, whatever, like that just seems so, it just seems so goofy. And that's kind of one of the things that you have to, you have to realize, sure. It is kind of goofy. And why is that a problem? <laughs> so when I decided that that it, it was much harder for me to be positive with myself. I would start giving others more compliments. That's how I started. That's really where it all kind of began. And eventually I was able to start complimenting myself. And there are other little goofy tricks that sound silly as well. You know, those, those thoughts of self-doubt, uh, whether that manifests as depression or anxiety, whatever the case may be, all those thoughts that, that creep into your head. Don't do that. That's just silly and dumb. You don't want to do that. You don't want to look like a goober in front of these people. Don't do that. Uh, one of the other techniques that I've adopted fairly recently, um, name it, name that voice. So you can start responding to it either, you know, inside your own head. So you don't sound too crazy when you're out walking around all of a sudden you just yell, shut up, Carl. <laughs> Um, but that's, that's one of those things you can, you start having those, those intrusive kind of thoughts where, no, don't do that. You, you'll, you'll look like a goofball. Shut up, Carl. I don't need to hear that right now. And it is effective. It sounds silly, just like complimenting yourself when you, when you look in the mirror and you think, man, I actually look pretty good today. There's, there's nothing that should stop you from thinking that about yourself. There's nothing that should stop you from, from being positive in that regard. So, um, the, the first big step for me was doing these TikToks. That was it. That was, that was where I started. And the, there, there's, I don't have a huge audience or anything. I'm not going to sit here and pretend I have millions of followers or anything. There's a few hundred people, which is, you know, more than I ever expected because I was just getting on there to be goofy initially. And then um, fostered some doggies, did that for a little bit. And then I started kind of really looking at, you know, what I can do to, to initiate these more positive thoughts. And it started with the TikToks and it's, it's slowly coming into my personal life. Um, it wasn't very long ago that I actually looked in the mirror and saw myself and I was like, fuck yeah, dude, look at you, you've come so far. And in that moment, that, that feeling of just like, wow, I really believe that about myself. After being a pessimist for my whole life, I honestly believe that I'm where I'm getting closer to where I want to be. And it, it took a while. It, it wasn't instantaneous because you know all the all the good work never is instantaneous. All the all the positive stuff, there is no quick fix. There is no instant change my mind into a, into a more reflective and, and positive person. It takes time and it takes work. Is there a um, like a personal story that you can share where practicing unconditional positive regard changed the outcome? Um, there are a few things that I can think of where I think that uh, that that kind of mentality and that that kind of 
of uh, lifestyle has definitely netted a positive return uh, in my family. Like it's, it's, it's evident that, you know, I'm a more loving and compassionate person and my mood in general has gotten better. I'm less angry all the time because <laughs> that was one of the big things with, uh, with being such a pessimist is that I was, I was always angry and I still get grumpy and I still have my moments, but by and large, um, I think, um, a recent example of when that, that kind of, uh, that kind of lifestyle really showed me something incredible was, uh, there was a gentleman that I work with, uh, who approached me and said, I really need to talk to you about something. And I feel like you're a safe person. And I was able to, to, sit down, listen, and constructively assist them with what their questions were. And I, I helped them come up with a plan and a way forward for them to, to deal with what they were dealing with. And had I not been the person that I am now, um, I don't know if I would have had the tools to really properly help that, that individual. And I think at the end of the day, the the net outcome of that whole process would not have been nearly as positive just based on you know how they weren't sure how to proceed with you know the way things were going and it's it's kind of hard to, to share too much about this story because i don't want to put anybody's business out there of course. of course um even without naming names but uh um that is i think one of the most recent examples that i can give okay yeah to me it sounds like it, it doesn't sound like it's an easy like switch in your head that you flip on, right? Like it's, it's like you said, the positive growth, it always seems to take time. It, it takes the longest for, for any, like, I feel like, <laughs> okay. Perfect example would be if I wanted to put on weight, I, get, I just got to eat a lot of food. Right. But if I want to lose that weight, I really got to put in the work at the gym for a while yeah. and be consistent with it. And yeah, you know, the positive stuff takes time. And if you really want to start changing how you interact with people and start practicing unconditional positive regard, you do have to start with the smaller steps, but they have to be consistent because if you slip up, you're going to fall back into the pessimism or the nihilism or whatever it is that you have going on that makes you want to stray away from that empathetic path. Absolutely. Um, like I said, if all the, the best things in life will work and you, you, you never really get prepared for those types of things. Um, I've, I've said before numerous times, uh, that's one of the, the funniest things about love is that we, we fall in love with a person because all those hormones are going through your body and everything's all feel good. And, you know, we get the warm fuzzies about every little thing that they do. And then all of a sudden they chew too loud. <laughs> and they want to argue about silly things and they want to talk about how they want to do go to a concert you have no interest in going to yada yada yada. all those things start start compounding you realize that love is work too and it's not just the warm fuzzies all the time like i i have to i wake up and i have to choose every day that i love my wife i have to wake up every day and choose her over everybody else and that type of mentality, that also takes work, that type of thing. And that's something that a lot of folks aren't prepared for. And just like that, just like love, just like, you know, being a better, more positive person, everything that's worth doing takes work. And it's unfortunate that there is no you know button I can push to just have nothing but the warm fuzzies again. It's unfortunate that I can't just push a button and flip my pessimism into optimism. But those struggles are character building and they lead way to a more permanent fixture in your life because you've worked so hard at it. And a lot of the things that don't take any work in our life, we take for granted. Mm -hmm. So when we have to work for things, I feel that it actually makes a more positive impact on our lives and the lives of others. That is one thing that we're kind of realizing collectively is for our generation, <clears throat> we would always congratulate people on accomplishments, on the end result, on, well, I can't 
say that another way because that's that's just the result but uh we're learning that we need to fall in love with the process and the effort it's not good job it's wow you tried really hard good job with that like i know that that's difficult so i've been following your physical transformation for the past four years now and it does seem as though you're like you're falling in love with that process you're saying I am working so hard all the time, and that's what I'm proud of. I'm yeah. not proud of the scale. I'm not proud of the the numbers on bench or whatever. I'm proud of the effort I'm putting in. Absolutely. And that's, that's another one of those things, like when we talk about um, the positive regard, is that uh, I, I have to remind myself, you know, this isn't about, you know, putting up the numbers. That's cool. That's fun. But it's... It's about being stronger, being physically in good health. And I know that, you know, I, I don't even know what my maxes are for anything. Like I lift. That's that's what I that's I actually like lifting now. Like it started out just like this is a chore, this is something I have to do just to to be in good shape. But I don't know what my max is for any of my my workouts. I have a rough idea, but I don't test max because I know once I make it about that it's going to be really hard for me to not be obsessive about it. Uh, it's, it's not about the, the end result. It's about the journey and the way that we get there is far more important than the end result in a lot of regards. Do I want to put up more weight when I sit on the bench? Absolutely. Do I need to? No, <laughs> I just want to be strong. I want to be you know, the best version of myself. That's all it is. And the best version of myself today will be a stepping stone to who I am tomorrow. And that's the kind of thing that I try really hard to keep sight of is that progress today is progress toward who I eventually want to become. And even then, as I progress, I can always do better. So eventually the goals that I had yesterday will be memories and I'll be into a new goal or better thought processes or whatever the case is. And there's a lot of people out there that'll talk about fitness in the regard of like, Oh, Hey, well, you know, if you you're depressed, you go for a walk, you go lift and make sure that stuff helps. It's always, always helpful. It's good to be in good shape. It's good to be healthy. It's good to, you know, have a, a more positive body image about yourself. All those, all those wonderful things. And that's not the whole thing though. I kind of liken it to that, that same deal is that, you know, that's part of the process. It's part of it. That's not the whole process. So the physical fitness originally started as part of my, my journey to being more mentally healthy as well, where it was like, this is a routine. This is something I can settle into. This is something I can focus on instead of, you know, the pessimism or the anger or the, whatever the case is. And, you know, then we, we get into the, the parts where we start, exploring the more uh, psychological aspects of it. Okay. Well I'm ADHD. Okay. Well, is that a contributor to the anxiety or is it the cause of the anxiety? And, you know, we start doing things like, Oh, maybe it's time to start getting on pills. And when my, my current counselor suggested it, I was like, I don't know if I want to do that. Like I'm, I'm not totally opposed to being on medicine, but there's a lot of factors in my life where I'm not sure how that's going to work out. So like, okay. Well, here's the number to the psychologist anyway, give them a call and talk to them. And here I am on ADHD medicine and my anxiety is better. My sleep patterns are better. Everything's getting so much better. And it's because the process has led me to this, this end of the physical fitness is great. The, the, uh, um, unconditional positive regard is great. The pills are working. Everything is, has come together. And it's created the the whole package of who I'm becoming. I'm still not done yet, but the progress is definitely evident. And that's exciting to me. Yeah, I feel like growth never actually stops. Um, like there's no perfect Yarl, you know, like you're not ever going to reach that, you know, top of the mountain just to start your decline. But I do think every day that you try to be the better best version of yourself 
is your top of the mountain moment. You know, every day you get to be the best you. And if that means you're better than you were yesterday, or maybe, maybe you're having a harder day today than you did yesterday, you're still being the best you, right? Growth doesn't have an end point, but the closest thing to it would be to live every day as if you are at your best. I think that's kind of, um, that's kind of how I view it. But there was something that you said a couple minutes ago that really struck a chord with me. And it was when you're talking about how relationships are tough and every day you have to choose to wake up to love your wife. <clears throat> what really struck me with that is we had a conversation with a wonderful man named Bright Mike uh, with a podcast called um, Mike's Podcast. Recovery is fucking awesome. Recovery is fucking awesome. I don't know why I was thinking Great title. Uh, you, you, we're not fu- or, what? <laughs> You're not, not fucked. fucked podcast. Yeah, I was getting Alexa. them mixed up. Um, but recovery is fucking awesome. And he's 15 years sober. Um, but one thing that he told us during that conversation that that stuck out to me then was that every day he chooses to wake up and fight his demons. And to me, every time I hear something like that, it just reminds me that growth is a choice. You have to choose growth when you wake up, whether that's going to be in the form of I'm choosing to love my wife, whether that's in the form of I'm choosing to stay sober, whether that's in the form of waking up to be your best self and choosing that. You have to choose growth. You can't wake up and say, I'm just going to do what I did yesterday. And I'm guilty of that. I am so guilty of waking up being like, I'm just going to do what I did yesterday and get through today. Uh, I woke up one day and I just wanted to go straight to bed, straight right back to sleep. I was like, fuck, I don't want to do this today. And yeah, you know, my journey of personal growth is is still ongoing. You know, if it wasn't for this podcast and being able to talk to some of the most wonderful people that I've had the opportunity to do so, I probably would be way further behind than I am now, but I'm still not where I want to be. But that doesn't mean I'm not going to be at the top of my mountain every fucking day. And I need to choose to be at the top of my mountain. And yeah, you know, I just thank you so much for pointing that out to me because choice is one of the most important things that you can you can go into growth with and you need to choose that. Um, there was a question I was going to ask you before I went on my little tangent there. <laughs> oh yeah, no problem. Um, so practicing unconditional positive regard, have you found any kind of limitations to it? Like no matter how much you uh, try to reach or uh, be empathetic or be conscientious towards somebody else or yourself, has there ever been a wall or a barrier that you just couldn't get through? Well, there's, there's always challenges. And uh, I think uh, it's, it's perfectly reasonable to, to say that you can't always be the best version of yourself. You can't always um, wake up and, and just do everything excellent. I think the biggest challenge for me has been that enduring uh, spirit of pessimism that I I kind of have. And a lot of the time when I'm struggling to be empathetic or I'm struggling to be um, a little more uh, observant of other people's uh, uh, limitations and things like that, I do have that hard time of, of just remembering that I can't allow that more egocentric part of me to take over. I can't allow that, that first person bias to sneak in because no matter how much we try and be empathetic and positive, there's always those, those intrusive thoughts. Like I was saying earlier, we, we can't eliminate those altogether. And that's where that grace comes in. That's where we, we look at that whole idea of, of giving ourselves grace when we fall short. That's a really important thing. There was a lot of, of different conversations I've had with my counselors where, you know, give yourself grace. You're, you're, you're going to mess it up every once in a while, and that's okay. Sometimes the best we can do is just go right back to bed. Sometimes the best we can do is just sit on the couch and breathe. And that's okay. 
you can do that because that's the heart of the positive regard. That's, that's yeah. where it is. You can admit your failings. Yeah. You could admit that you, you fallen short and that's okay. Because that's, that's the, the grace that you have to give yourself. Mm -hmm. And it's the grace that I hope to give others as well. You can't just say that every day I'm going to be nothing but sunshine and rainbows start to finish because I'm going to wake up and I'm going to step on my dog's paw and think I'm a garbage person for doing that. Right. It's going to happen. And then I have to remember something you spoke earlier about, you know, every day is a new day. Well, how about every moment's a new moment? But every minute's a new minute. Every hour is a new hour. And the negative thing that occurred in the past is already in the past. So those types of things, those realities, those types of encouraging, graceful thoughts are what we have to plug in to stop those leaks in our, our psychological you know, detriment. Do you happen to have any advice for how somebody can go about looking at life in that manner? So this way they can start practicing their own version of personal growth and unconditional positive regard. The, the biggest thing that I can ever offer is like, if you're struggling, please see somebody. Like I, I, I've, I've been in situations where, where people have, have bottled up their emotions, bottled up their anger, their frustration, their sadness. And I've seen the worst in those scenarios in a few regards. And that to me is one of the, the saddest things is that because of the stigmas in society, because of the things that um, other people have, have told their children or the things that friends have, you know, Un, maybe unknowingly visited upon their, their, their companions, folks haven't gotten to get the help they need. And I, I want to stress that if you're struggling, you need to go talk to somebody. There's nothing wrong with it. Apart from that, the, the best advice that I personally can give as an amateur psychology major, you know, is uh, start small, start small and, and don't overdo it. If it's, too much, then it's too much. And that's okay. And like I'm saying, start small, give yourself grace. Those are the two best pieces of advice. Like there's, there's really not much else I can say, you know, without having to, to sit down with somebody and really get to know them. It, it takes that level of understanding and empathy to really be able to say, I think though the way you are maybe doing this would be helpful, but that's really a conversation that I would encourage people to have with a counselor, with a, with a therapist, a psychologist, whatever the case may be. Um, hotlines would be more helpful than nothing, <laughs> but yeah, there, all those resources are out there. Uh, and I know you know the medical industry being what it is and insurance being what it is, maybe it's not an option for everybody, but worst case scenario, Talk to your friends and family, find an understanding person, a, a kind ear, somebody who will give you that grace in return. If you can't provide grace for yourself, find somebody who will. Those are my best pieces of advice I can offer as far as it's concerned. I do think this is a perfect opportunity for me to mention to any of our listeners and viewers out there. Uh, if you do have a hard time figuring out exactly how you want to get started on your mental health journey, you can always check down below in our description. We do have a link uh, for betterhelp.com forward slash NSLP. It's an online tool that you can utilize to get connected to a therapist when at, at your needs and then they're going to be able to assist you and you'll be able to actually talk to somebody. Uh, I, I fully, fully support anybody trying to seek counseling and wanting to sit down and talk to somebody. If betterhelp.com forward slash NSLP is outside of your price range, you don't have insurance, whatever it may be, Hit up Aaron and I. Just send us an email or a message on Instagram or even Yarl here, I'm sure, wouldn't mind, you know, listening to your story and shooting you a message back or something and providing some words of encouragement. But just please reach out because I really do think the world is full of so many difficult experiences. If you continue to try and handle those thinking that you can do it on your own, Think again. Sure, we can each handle situations as they come on our own, but 
I don't know where I would be in my life with the challenges I've faced without my friends, without my wife, without the people that I love and I know who are around me. And I have to assume that my experiences in life are similar to everyone else's, at least in terms of severity and how they affect me. So please reach out. That's 100% echoing uh, Jarl here. Uh, he's the king of this domain here. And, you know, I just love hearing what he has to say. So thank you for that advice, Jarl. Absolutely. Um, super important that uh, that people get what they need, especially when it comes to, to mental health things. Uh, I know uh, a lot of the a lot of the the talk around mental health has been more positive lately, and that has been so wonderful that our world's mind is changing, and we're being more assertive when it comes to to mental health. And I think that that trend, if I could not do anything else with my life, it would be to continue assisting in in removing those stigmas. You have yeah. done an amazing job transforming from a pessimist into an improvenist and i'm incredibly proud to know you and have you in my circle i feel the same about you buddy you've been you've always been a really positive guy and that was kind of one of the you you have been an inspiration uh i i think about the way that you've regarded many others in in our lives and it, it has been a very helpful kind of example thank you for that i've been uh spending a lot of days surviving here lately. So uh, I've been looking to you guys for for more guidance and direction. We all need help sometimes. Hell yeah. Amen. Aaron's just flat out crazy, so. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't we all? Aren't we all? Just a little maybe. bit at least, yeah. Well, if not full blown, um, real quick before uh, we wrap up, fellas, I just want to uh, give uh, your listeners just a few uh, uh, book recommendations here. Uh, some of the things that have kind of inspired me and helped me uh, to understand more about myself, the world around me, things of that nature. Um, I haven't mentioned The Holy Man yet, but a uh, good philosophical read that uh, deals with a lot of different behaviors and a lot of different really interesting stories. It's it's a short read. It's not hard to, to get into. Uh, I was reluctant to start reading it back when I was in technical college when I was 18 years old, but I, it ended up being my my favorite book um, right up until I found some others that were equally as, as enriching. Uh, Leaders Eat Last. It's a wonderful book, even if you don't plan on leading anybody. If uh, you just want to look at it from the lens of like, how do I be a better parent? It works for that too. Uh, Man's Search for Meaning is an absolute classic and it's more along the lines of a psycho psychological read. Um, the gentleman who wrote it, Victor Frankl, uh, was a psychologist, um, surviving in Jewish concentration camps during world war II, and his unique perspective. Um, basically the, the end state of that book is meaning is whatever you want it to be, which I think is a beautiful message. Honestly, you get to create your own meaning and that is super powerful. I think, um, uh, how to stop losing your shit with your kids. Wonderful read for parents out there. Wonderful read for people who just want to know how to deal with kids better. Uh, it's a great book. It's got an awesome title. It's wonderful. Uh, the art of caring leadership, another leadership book. Um, wonderful read. Um, a lot of really enriching stuff that kind of goes along with the, the message of the day. There's a lot of things in there about how to, how to handle employees in a way that makes them feel more empowered and, and, more capable of doing their jobs. Um, and then of course I, I mentioned the, the, the Greek philosophers earlier. Uh, yeah, sure. It, it's, it's just philosophy, but, uh, Hey, uh, that's where a lot of our principles for psychology come from. So always recommend, uh, getting into the, the work of the philosophers and Stoics of old. It's, uh, there's some really great enriching stuff in there that will help you kind of guide you as it did me with searching for a way to kind of battle the, the pessimism, uh, I think a lot of the the portions of uh, Epictetus's uh, Enchiridion were pretty instrumental in some of my ways of thinking about how I, I view the unconditional positive regard piece. So just a few recommendations. There's there's lots out there as far as the re those resources are concerned. Those are the ones that I just found to be the most beneficial to me personally. So check them out. Well, thank you very much for sharing that with us, Jarl. Uh, I think in our description below, we're going to probably post a Jarl's reading list or required readings down below. <laughs> um, so this way 
the listeners can go and check out the summaries of the books and see if that's something that they're interested in getting their hands on and reading and purchasing on Kindles or maybe find an audio book. I don't know. Maybe, uh, honestly, Jarl, I, I really think you should get into the the habit of uh, narrating audio books because I think you have a wonderful voice. You, this is something you should be doing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, uh, like I said, it's not the first time I've heard that. Uh, it's been, uh, I think there was a high school teacher was the first one that said that uh, I should be on the radio uh, back when radios were more relevant, of course. <laughs> Hell yeah. Aging myself a little bit. That's okay. <laughs> and uh, before we sign off over here, Aaron, uh, I just want to go ahead and remind the listeners real quick that if you're listening to us on Spotify or Apple or any other podcast listening platform, we are also doing video over on YouTube and we have clips up on our TikTok and Instagram. So I highly recommend if you're interested and if you enjoy this content to subscribe and um, check us out and you'll be able to find our new episodes every Friday and know exactly where to listen to them at and maybe watch them or, you know, give us a like and a thumbs up over on YouTube, all the good stuff. Uh, so I really appreciate your time today, Yarl. Absolutely. So it was an honor to be here. Love to uh, love the conversation. You gentlemen are awesome. Keep up the good work, please. You're you're sharing stories that are extremely valuable and there cannot be enough appreciation for that type of thing. You guys are doing the good work. Thank you. And a huge thanks to all of you for listening. This has been Aaron and Tim with everybody's favorite outsider, Jarl Skoggy. Massive shout out to Highland Markle for the original music. Share this episode with somebody who could benefit from it. Let us know what you want to hear our take on. Or shoot us a message if you want to collab or just talk. All pertinent links can be found in the episode description. Be good to yourselves and each other. We love you. Peace! Our podcast is for entertainment purposes and cannot be substituted for professional medical advice. If you need help now, please call 911 or 988 for immediate intervention. Bye.